if you like butterflies, you will have to like cocoons. Uh, we think of uh, David as a great man of God. Uh, before every great decision, he prayed, or most every decision. Uh, he wrote psalms. He wrote songs of worship. Uh, he delighted in God's word. He was called a man after God's own heart. That may be David the butterfly, but David also had some cocoon moments when he was discouraged, defeated, disobedient. We find one of David's cocoon moments in our text today. Turn in your Bible to 1 Samuel 27. If you want to use our Bibles under the chairs, it's on page 296. So let's just remind ourselves where we've been. David was anointed to become the next king of Israel. He defeated the giant Goliath, delivered the people of Israel from the Philistines. Saul hired him to be a commander in his army, and David was very successful, winning battle after battle against the Philistines. Uh, David uh, was married to Michal, Saul's daughter, who fell in love with him. Uh, Saul's son, Jonathan, the heir to the throne, fell in love with David and they became his best friend. All this made Saul very angry, jealous of David being the next king and his kids loving him. And so he tried to kill him many times. David fled into the Dead Sea Desert. And he was on the run for 10 years. He had an opportunity to kill Saul one time, but he restrained himself actually twice and left vengeance to God. A wealthy man, Nabal, insulted David. And so David decided to kill him and all his men. And he was coming to do so. But then he restrained himself and decided to leave vengeance to God. Then starting in 1 Samuel 27, David makes a series of bad choices and begins to spiral away from God into disillusionment. The same thing can happen to you. There were four things that weakened David, and these things can weaken you as well. First, he was weakened by discouragement. Saul is getting the best of David. He has tasked 3,000 Navy SEAL-type soldiers to capture David, leaving him in caves to sleep in and hiding behind trees. Saul has David on the ropes. Listen to David. But David thought to himself, one of these days I'll be destroyed by the hand of Saul. Notice that David thinks to himself. He doesn't pray to God. David has reached nearly the 10-year mark being a fugitive, running in panic from place to place in the Dead Sea Desert. He's tired. He can't get his mind off of Saul. Saul's determined to get him. Wherever he goes, Saul chases him down. David's exhausted. Look at his Eeyore drone. David thought to himself, one of these days I'll be destroyed by the hand of Saul. No hope. Most of all, no God. David focuses on Saul. He hangs Saul's poster on his wall. He replays his voice messages. David knows better. In brighter moments, David modeled the right way to handle tough times. First time he faced the Philistines in the wilderness, David inquired of the Lord. When he felt small against his enemy, David inquired of the Lord. When he was attacked by the Amalekites, David inquired of the Lord. Puzzled about what to do after the death of Saul? Read this with me. David inquired of the Lord. When he was crowned as king and pursued by the Philistines, read this with me, David inquired of the Lord. Confused? He inquired of the Lord. Challenged? He talked to God. Afraid? He prayed to God. But not this time. 
This time he talks to himself. Poor choice. Look at the advice he gives himself. But David thought to himself, one of these days I'll be destroyed by the hand of Saul. The best thing I can do is escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will give up searching for me anywhere in Israel and I will slip out of his hands. Samuel tells David he's going to be the next king of Israel. Jonathan tells David, you're going to be the next king of Israel. Abigail, his wife, says, David, you're going to be the next king of Israel. He forgets about all their words. He's losing hope. When you keep thinking about the giants in your life, the problems you face, you will get discouraged. It is inevitable. This has been the theme of the series. Don't focus on the troubles you have, the challenges you face. Focus on God. How much greater he is. Spend time in the Bible. Try to do it every day. Use our journals. Pray to God about everything you're going to go through in a day. Come to worship. Otherwise, you're vulnerable to discouragement. Timothy, Teller in his book, Timothy Keller, in his book, Making Sense of God, it's kind of funny, this is a side story, uh, Joel our son uh, teaches tennis in Manhattan, and he was doing his laundry one day, and Tim Keller walked in. Turns out he lives in the same apartment complex, pastor of a church in New York. So in his book, he says, when people say their life is meaningless, it doesn't usually mean that they don't have good jobs or good families or many friends or plenty to live, live on. It means that they're wondering if all their work, all their activity amounts to anything. Is it worth anything other than just keeping myself alive? In order to have meaning in life, we have to have a, a sense that what we're doing is making a difference in the world. Something's, we're serving some purpose beyond ourselves. Now, this psychological truth is inarguable. Psychologist... Research scientist and writer, Adil Gawande, tells about a, uh, a doctor uh, convincing an administrator of a nursing home to buy some dogs, cats, rabbits, parakeets, and some egg-laying hens. The change in the nursing home was significant. People that they thought were totally out of it would sleep most of the day, began to wake up. People they thought had lost it and uh, were non-ambulatory began walking down to the nurse station saying, I'll walk the dog. All the parakeets were adopted and named. Use of psychotropic drugs dropped to 38% of the previous level. The death rate dropped 15%. Gawande asked why. He said, it's obvious. It's meaning in life. If you just feed people and clothe them and house them, that's not enough to feel like their life has any purpose. They need to know that their life is making some sort of difference in the world. That's what happened to David. He loses his purpose. All he's thinking about is staying alive. And so he gets discouraged. Second, he's weakened by disobedience. David thought to himself, one of these days I'll be destroyed by the hand of Saul. Best thing I can do is escape to the land of the Philistines. Seems like a crazy idea. You remember that David did this 10 years earlier? He was desperate and so he escaped and he, to the land of the Philistines and nearly lost his life. He thought 10 years earlier, so what if I'm wrong? I'm not hurting anybody else. But this time it's different. He's got 600 soldiers who work for him and their families. He leads these men and their families into the land of idols, false gods, and abhorrent moral practices. So David and the 600 men with him left and went over to Achish, son of Maoh, king of Gath. 
David and his men settled in Gath with Achish. Each man had his family with him. And David had his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail of Carmel. Now, I don't say God wanted David to have two wives, but I just want to point out that was very common in those days. Notice he doesn't have McCall. When David fled to the Dead Sea Desert, Saul gave McCall in marriage to another man. When Saul was told that David had fled to Gath, he no longer searched for him. David's plan, plan works. Saul stopped hunting him. David lets out a huge sigh of relief. His men can now sleep with both eyes closed. Their children can attend kindergarten. Their wives can unpack the suitcases. Living in disobedience brings temporary relief. Doesn't it always? Stop resisting alcohol and you'll laugh for a while. Move out on your spouse and you'll relax for a time. Indulge in pornography and you'll get a buzz for a season. But then the consequences of sin sink in. The guilt comes. The loneliness of breaking up rushes in. Solomon writes, there's a way that appears to be right. But in the end, it leads to death. Then David said to Achish, if I found favor in your eyes, let a place be assigned to me in one of the country towns that I may live there. Why should your servant live in the royal city with you? Notice David calls himself a servant of the king of Gath. What a turn of events. The giant killer. The person who has been the Philistines worst nightmare for the last 10 years winning battle after battle against the Philistines, now calls himself their servant. So on that day, Achish gave him Ziklag, and his belonged to the kings of Judah ever since. David lived in Philistine territory a year and four months. Achish welcomes the deal. Now David and his men went up and raided the Geshurites, the Gerzites, and the Amalekites. Uh, these are some of the people God had told Joshua to drive out of the land, but he'd been unable to dislodge. Whenever David attacked an area, he did not leave a man or woman alive, but he took sheep, cattle, donkeys, camels, and clothes. Then he returned to Achish. He did not leave a man or woman alive to be brought to Gath, for he thought they might inform on us and say, this is what David did. And such was his practice as long as he lived in Philistine territory. He didn't leave anybody alive because he didn't want word getting back to Achish. If you're not a believer, or even if you are a Christian, you may have trouble with reading this, that David destroyed whole cities. But you have to remember that these were people that had the same roots as the Israelites. They had the knowledge of God like them, but they chose a different path. And they embraced some of the most abhorrent practices of any people in the history of this world. God gave them 800 years to repent. So remember that when you read these accounts. God was merciful. When Achish asked, where did you go raiding today? David would say, against the Negev of Judah. Or against the Negev of Jerahmeel. Or against the Negev of the Kenites. This was a lie. He was trying to give the impression that he was raiding the Israelites instead of raising, raiding people that were relatives of the Philistines. This is not David's finest hour. He lies, then he covers it up with bloodshed. He continues his duplicity for 16 months. From this season, no Psalms exist. His harp hang silent. Achish trusted David and said to himself, he has become so obnoxious to his people, the Israelites, that he'll be my servant for life. In those days, the Philistines gathered their forces to fight against Israel. Achish said to David, you must understand that you and your men will accompany me in the army. David said, then you will see for yourself what your servant can do. Achish replied, very well, I will make you my bodyguard for life. The Philistines decided 
attack King Saul and the Israelites. By the way, this is when Saul will die. David's disobedience is drawing him further and further into compromise. The champion for God, the champion for driving people out of the land God had commanded Moses years before to drive out, is now being asked to go to war against the Israelites. Envision U.S. Army joining the Taliban. I don't judge David for decisions he made. I mean, he was just trying to stay alive. He was trying to survive. In fact, I don't judge anybody, or I try not to judge anybody. I don't know their motivations. I don't know their hearts. I don't think my, of myself being better than other people. After all, who am I to judge other people? After all the things I've done, the things I do, you don't ever hear me speak out against world leaders, politicians, movie stars, famous musicians or athletes. Why? Because I always assume there are guests in the room. Every week we have people here that are Christians and non-Christians. We know they're here. We want them to know that we want them here. Churches get this wrong all the time. I hear pastors speak out against people by name, condemning them. I don't do that. Imagine if I were going off about Serena Williams today. Serena Williams is the best women's tennis player of all times. She's won 23 Grand Slam titles. Ten months ago, she had a baby, Alexis Olympia. After the birth, cesarean blood clots formed in her chest, and it got very serious very quickly. She had a long recovery from that, but six months later, she was able to come back to play the U.S. Open in New York. Amazingly, after not playing, she made it all the way through six rounds to the finals against a gal named Naomi Osaka. P pretty new to tennis, never been in a championship a match before. Osaka won the first set, and she was leading in the second set. But then Serena was turning it around, and Serena is known for her comebacks. And then the official called her for cheating. Now, tennis is kind of a weird sport. No coaching is allowed. Most sports allow coaching, you know, all the time. So in tennis, the coach will sit in the stands, and coaches, you know, just can't control themselves. They'll be doing stuff like, you know, move your feet or come to the net, and it's done all the time. And the official decided in the championship match to call cheating on Serena. Serena just went nuts. She says, I don't cheat. I've got a little baby girl. I'd rather lose than cheat. And he assessed her a point. She lost that game. On the changeover, she started yelling at the ref, and she got so mad, she threw down a racket, and it, you know, just was destroyed. And he assessed her a whole game. She says, you're taking me out of the match. She lost. And in the Australian Open, just a few weeks ago, she made it to the fourth round and played Karolina Pliskova. She was leading 4-6, 6-4, 5-1. That means she was up two breaks. It was inevitable she was going to win. Then she rolled her ankle. Serena says, that didn't have any bearing on my performance. But she lost six straight games. So I could go off today about Serena Williams and say, you know, she doesn't have any self-control over her anger. She gives up too easily. But I don't do stuff like that. And I don't judge David. You know, I don't believe in this we-they mentality. You know, we in the church, we're good, and they out there are bad. I mean, come on. We get up the same time. We go to the same jobs. We raise our kids the same way. We put on our pants the same way. There's no, we have a lot more in common with everybody else in the world. 
than things not in common. That's why I don't judge others. And I don't judge David. He's just trying to stay alive. That's why he goes to live in Gath. King Achish invites David to go with the army to fight against Saul and the Israelites. But the Philistine commanders are having nothing to do with it. They say, you can't trust David. In the middle of the battle, he may turn on you. And so Achish dismisses David and tells him to take his men home. So David and his men got up early in the morning to go back to the land of the Philistines, and the Philistines went up to Jezreel. Providentially, God dismisses David from having to go to fight against his own people. Third, he's weakened by sorrow. David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziklag. They had attacked Ziklag and burned it, and had taken captive the women and everyone else in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men reached Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire, and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. David loses his two wives and his family. His 600 men lose their families. As far as David and his soldiers are concerned, they are widowed. The Amalekites were known for their cruelty in killing people they captured. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives had been captured, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal. Dismissed by the Philistines, attacked by the Amalekites, no country to fight for, no family to come home to. Can matters grow worse? They can. David's men started looking for rocks. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. The men suggested that David should be stoned. I mean, after all, it was his idea that we move to the land of the Philistines. It was his idea not to kill Saul when he had an opportunity twice. His, it was his idea to raid these other cities, and now one of them was seeking revenge. It was his idea to go to war against the Israelites. That's what left their families vulnerable. David feels this responsibility. He has to bear, I mean, to, to lose his own wives and family was one thing. But for all the men who worked for him to lose theirs too, that was too much for him to bear. These were men who had risked their lives for him in his flight from Saul. He had not only brought destruction on himself, but on the men who served him so loyally. He could understand why the men thought about stoning him. David was a king without a throne, a husband without a wife, a leader without followers, and a believer without a story. This was his reward for 10 years of running and trusting God to fulfill his promise to make him the next king. We wonder if David is regretting his decision to move to Gath. Maybe he's longing for the good old cave days, live out um, in the hot rocks in the Dead Sea Desert, now in the ruins of Ziklag with his men gathering stones to throw at him. Does he regret his prayerless decision to move to the land of the Philistines? What will David do? How we handle our cloudy days and dark nights says a lot about who we are. I realize you may not be in a season of cloudy days, Things may be going great for you. I have a great life. I have a lot of fun. But I understand that life is hard. And many people come to church discouraged. So I have to address cloudy days. How do you handle yours? When you're tired of trying, tired of forgiving, Tired of hard works with hard work, dealing with hard-headed people? How do you manage your cloudy days? With a bottle of pills or whiskey? 
with an hour at the bar, an afternoon in the mall, a day at the spa, a week at the coast? Do bars and binges and beds and crashes into Gath offer any real solution? We assume they re-energize the sad life, but do they? I mean, no one denies that they help for a time, but over the long haul, they may numb the pain, but do they remove it? What did David do when he had nothing left to do? But David found strength in the Lord his God. He came back to God. He returned to prayer. This is the lesson I want all of us to get from today. Find strength in the Lord God. Read that with me. Find strength in the Lord God. Teenager, single, married, widower, divorced, retired person, what do you do when you face giants? What do you do when you don't know what to do? What do you do when you're desperate? What do you do when you face cloudy days and dark nights? Find strength in the Lord God. Talk to God. Spend time with Him in the Bible, in our journal. Pray to Him. Parents, this is one of the most important things you can teach your child. God will help you through cloudy days if you don't give up. Don't make the mistake of Florence Chadwick. In 1952, Florence attempted to swim from Catalina Island, the chilly waters, to the California coast. For 15 hours, she battled the waves and the clouds. It was foggy. It was terrible weather. And then she says, I can't go anymore. And her mom said, no, don't give up. Honey, your mom's in the boat next to her. And so she kept trying. And after a while, she just stopped swimming. She says, I got to get out. So they lifted her up into the boat. And then they rowed for just a couple minutes. And the fog broke, the mist broke. And there was the California coast just a half mile away. At the news conference, she said, if I had only seen the shore, I would have made it. All I saw was the fog. Lift your eyes to the shore. Don't be fooled by the fog. The finish may be only strokes away. God may be preparing you for something wonderful just on the other side of the fog. Give grace one more time. Be generous one more time. Teach one more class. Encourage one more person. Share your story with one more person. Swim one more stroke. David did. Right there in the smoldering ruins of Ziklag, he found strength. After 16 months in Gath, after the Philistine rejection, the Amalekite attack, the insurrection by his men, he remembered what to do. David found strength in the Lord his God. It's good to have you back, David. We missed you while you were away. Lord God, thank you for this story. We identify with David. We face cloudy days. We face challenges and troubles and sicknesses and relationship problems. And we need to hear this to find our strength in you, to focus on you, not our problems your strength, and spend time with you every day. Pray to you. I don't know what's going on in your life, but I got a pretty good guess that you're facing problems. So I want you to tell God what you're facing and to tell him that you want to do this. You want to find your strength in him this week. So I want to give you a chance to pray right now. If you've never given your life to Christ, you could just say, Christ, I've heard enough. I want you in my life. Come in. Forgive my sin. You pray right now.
Father, thank you for hearing each one of us. We can all talk to you at the same time, and you, you manage that. We commit to not focusing on the things that are obstacles in our lives, fog in our lives this week, but to focus on you. And that gives us new hope as we go out from here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.